Welcome to Beautifully Bloomed, the podcast where we explore how to break you out of the box of rules and beliefs that are holding you back from the life you are meant to live. I'm your host, Rebecca Turvo. Join me as I share mindset tools, coaching conversations, and human design to help you uncover your unique gifts and create the life, relationships, and business you desire. So today I am joined by Miranda Davidson, who was a former Jehovah's Witness who left in her 30s. And so this is the reason she's on our podcast today to talk about how she grew up in that religion and how she decided to leave. And I'm really excited to have her here. So thank you so much for joining me, Miranda. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yay. I'm excited too. Um, so I, my first question always is like, what were, so I know you said Jehovah's Witness and some people might not even know what that is. So like, what, how did you grow up? Like, what were the beliefs or the doctrine or was there rules? Like, what was that for you? <laughs> Okay, so they are very Bible focused, but their version of the Bible and Christianity is pretty strict. So there's no celebrating birthdays, there's no celebrating holidays, like no Christmas, no New Year's or Mother's Day or Fourth of July or Thanksgiving, any of it. And no voting, no serving in the military, um, no flag salute, national anthem. They take it very seriously that they are like separate from any world government or any other organization. So it's very much an isolated group that only mingles amongst themselves. So you're really discouraged from having close associations with outsiders even your own family members or neighbors or schoolmates, if they're not believers, um, the teaching is that there is an impending judgment day and that God will be bringing destruction upon the globe and all non-Jehovah's Witnesses are likely to perish. And that's constantly being pushed as any day now, imminent. So it, it's kind of weird. Like, um, yeah, you can't go play with your neighbor, Sally, because she's probably going to die from fireballs from heaven tomorrow. So a little bit a, a different outlook. So you see people as outsiders. You really tend to only associate with those within the community. Yeah. And what's the leadership like? Is there like a head guy or is there a bunch of head guys? I assume they're guys. Yes. Big surprise, right? Um, as with most Bible-based organizations, it's very patriarchal. So men have the leadership roles. Um, the original founder was in the late 1800s and was an individual guy. The leadership passed down to a few other individual guys, but during my lifetime, it's been a committee. There were at least seven to nine different committee members that were the leadership. Um, oh, okay. The governing body that made the decisions. Yeah. So was there any like dress code or like the ways you have to dress or behave or things you can't do, right? Like there's. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Just <curious>. Of course. <laughs> what would a patriarchal community be without dress codes and rules? Um, so there's, there was different standards for official, you know, church activities compared to outside. So if you were attending the services or going out knocking on doors, which we were expected to do, you know, 10 hours a month, roughly as a woman, I would have to wear a dress and, or skirt that at least covers my knees and length and my shoulders. So not the most conservative, others are, are more strict, um, but pretty conservative. Men would be required to wear suit pants, you know, slacks, dress shirt, and a tie if they're, you know, in any official church business. And then if they're on stage giving a sermon, they have to wear a jacket as well. Men were not allowed to have beards or goatees, any facial hair besides a mustache. Um, no one was allowed to have like artificial hair colors like purple or green or something like that. You could wear your hair long or short. You could wear makeup as long as it wasn't too extreme or outlandish. Outside of church, um, pretty normal dress. I would say like you couldn't wear something really skimpy. Like I could not wear a dress that was shorter than knee length, but I could wear shorts and I could wear a top and could wear a bathing suit, a regular bathing suit, no bikinis, of course. <laughs> but, Modesty a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, basically what you would think of a 1950s standard nuclear family kind of American culture, that was pretty much the ideal. That was Yeah. So it's like uh, the ideal is to get married in the church to somebody who believes the same way as you do. 
the children, right? Is that kind of it? Um, I'm surprisingly not on the children. If the, the Bible-based groups do emphasize that, but with the whole judgment day is tomorrow and fiery destruction, they, a lot of people in that community chose not to have children or were encouraged to wait until after judgment day when they're expecting the earth to be restored to the garden of Eden paradise condition. Okay. Um, a lot of postponing your hopes and dreams. Don't get your career now. Don't have kids now. Don't start a retirement fund now. This whole world's going to end probably tomorrow. Okay. So, you, so, and they've been waiting for it to end since 18 something. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. 1870s or I think well, expectation was 1914. I think. And then they've had a lot of dates since then they've been, been expecting like, yeah, it's interesting because it's like, it's almost like postponing your whole life. And but that is, I think, in a lot of religious groups, the, the idea is, oh, we're just here temporarily. I mean, we didn't have that belief you just said about the earth. I don't know, like, we're not going to be w- waiting to be restored to the earth or something. We're waiting for Jesus to come back. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, but it's like what the whole thing that you said that resonates with me is like well it's not really important to have like focus on what's going on in your life right now follow these rules believe this and you're getting to heaven that's the goal the goal is getting to heaven so in your case it was to get to this new paradise earth right right the paradise earth which yeah i mean (laughs) if you're living forever it doesn't matter whether it's distant realm or if it's on this realm you're going to be perfect you have everything you want everything's good. Right. So So let's not bother with people who aren't believing this way because they're just they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone anyway. So it doesn't matter. Don't start going to college because there's no way the system will last for four more years. So there's no time. So interesting. (laughs) Well, that's not forever. So once you make it to paradise then you'll have eternities, you can study you can learn anything you want. You can explore hobbies. You can finally learn to play ukulele then like whatever you want to do then. But now you've got to work, work, work all the you've time. You've got to work to try to tell other people is what it's yes. like. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So you have to spend all your time studying and making sure you're doing the right things and then getting out to try to warn people, let them know judgment is coming and try to save them. So a lot of pressure, a lot of fear, obligation, and guilt, which are the three big factors that to look for to spot that a group is maybe called a cult or a high control organization if they're using those to, to motivate them. Yeah. I've heard of the term high demand religion. I would think that, I mean, definitely this seems to fall in. <laughs> to them. Yeah. So now how does it feel for you? Like, when did you have to start knocking on doors? Cause this is what I think of when I think of Jehovah's witnesses, I'm like, Oh yeah, those are the people that knock on the door. That's all I, you know, that's what I thought about them. So. Right. Then, cause that is their primary thing. And- but every every member is expected to. So that's very different than say um, Mormons who pledge to do like a one year or two year missionary trip. And they focus that period of their life. They do the door knocking and then they're done and they have a new life. But there is no um, concept of that is from the time you're born. I took my, my babies out there, like newborn, a week old, two weeks old. I would just take them out with me knocking on doors. So my mother joined when I was a year old. So Pretty much from the time I was a toddler, preschool, I was going with her. As I could read, I had my own, my own pitch, my own spiel. And I would memorize like a certain scripture I was going to use and have a little pamphlet. The earliest I remember is age four that I had my little memorized presentation. I was knocking on doors myself and saying my little. What? When you were four years old? Mm-hmm. And my, my two oldest daughters were the same way because I was teaching them the same and I was taking them with me and they would, even if they just say a few words, like, here's a fact about paradise and, and to get lots of praise, you know, because you go back to the car and there's four or five of your you know peers that are waiting for you and they all tell you, you did a good job and take you to the ice cream cone. And, you know, there's a lot of positive reinforcements within the community. So, yeah. Yeah. So did it, I mean, when did you start having doubts? about this? Well, I was disfellowshipped, excommunicated, um, shunned for a few years in my early adulthood. Um, at oh, the- well, what's that about? Or why? <laughs> like, curious. I'll say, so I had my first few doubts then, and I didn't really pursue that until later. But yeah, why'd you get excommunicated? 
Well, there's a whole long list of things you you can't do. And so whenever you choose to get baptized, which I was 14 when I got baptized, I knew what the rules were and what I wasn't allowed to do. And that includes drugs and smoking and watching R-rated movies and voting, celebrating Christmas, going to church. But of course, the most common sin that gets a lot of people is having sex with someone to whom you're not married, which what happened for me. The church elders, they had a secret trial in the back of the church with um, three elders questioning me about all the gruesome details. They needed to know lots of very specific details about it and read a lot of scriptures, prayed about it. And at that point, they had to decide whether to forgive and, you know, just privately discipline me or to excommunicate me. And that's what, what they did. They decided that um, I'm just like my, my first offense. I had been a pretty good kid. I was homeschooled. Um, I never watched an R-rated movie. Like I, I followed all the rules and taught them, but I had. Yeah. So you followed all the rules, but what? Except for that was a kind of a big rule that I didn't follow. So right. I, I knew that was the, the consequences. Um, I had met someone that I worked with and started dating secretly. And then, yeah, it was found out and confessed and um they so secretly dating because you weren't allowed to date him well yeah I mean he wasn't in the church so oh, okay yeah that I met at work you know I was working at waitress at this local restaurant so so like what, you do when you're 18 <laughs> right so this is normal behavior for 18 year olds but what then made you feel like you had to go confess like why I mean, you could have not, right? Or could you? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I, I don't think I could have not. I mean, first off, my my mom confronted me or suspected my mom confronted me. So I confessed to her first and then she took me right to the church altar. So confessed to them, and then they went through the whole process, invited me to their trial, which I went to and, and didn't know you're, su- I guess, supposed to cry and they'll find you sorry. I, I didn't cry that time. I, w- I was pretty stoic. And I guess that's why they decided I wasn't proving that I was sorry enough. So they went ahead and disfellowshipped me, which means um, during the next church service, they like, like paused the ser- service midway through and somebody walks up on stage to make an announcement to say that Miranda Davidson is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And then the entire room of like 70 people gasps, turns to stare at me in horror. And then from that moment on, I don't exist to them. They can't speak. They can't make eye contact with me. They can't eat in the same room that I'm in. I just like, I become completely invisible. So. But then you just stop going to church, right? Like, um, why, yeah, I don't so know. I, was, I was living with my parents then and they wanted me to keep going to church and like apply for, you know, write an official petition for forgiveness to get readmitted, but you still have to go attend church services for at least six months, but they won't give you an exact number of how long you have to do that. I just um, couldn't deal with that. It was really stressful because I had always been a good role model before that. And it was really hard to accept that I had, you know, that role as the sinner and the warning example. And so I just got a job and moved out and got my own apartment and didn't know a soul in the world except for the guy that I'd been seeing. That must have been hard. Like, yeah, I just started from scratch. So I, I turned 19 that summer right after that. But yeah, I was just, okay. I'm going to figure this out. And I figured it out. Um, It takes a lot of courage, I think, because you grew up in such a sheltered. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I can do Christmas now. Um, I guess. Let's see what that's all about. Like I'm a sinner and, you know, judgment day is coming anyway, but what else is going to happen? Like I started to experiment with worldly things like drinking and I didn't really cut loose much. I was still pretty responsible because I knew I didn't have a fallback. Like I can't really move back in with my parents. They don't even speak to me. So I have to keep my job. I can't, you know, try drugs. You know, my friends are like, Hey, do you want to try weed? I'm like, no, no, I I can't take a risk. I have to be responsible. My job, I'm going to pay my rent. I'm going to figure out how credit scores work and taxes and I'm going to do it. And, and I did. And um, yeah. So I'm curious, like, how does it feel then? Cause your family wasn't able to talk to you or did they talk to you? Uh, no, they didn't. Other than 
what's uh, allowed, which is necessary family business. So they contacted me um, when each of my grandparents was dying um, during that three-year span. I lost my my grandma and, and grandpa. So, so that was the only one they had with my parents was like, hey, grandpa's in the hospital. Um, it's on life support. If you want to come up here, all the family's here. Yeah, you were allowed to go to that. Yeah, because my parents were the only Jehovah Witnesses in their family, none of the extended family, aunts and uncles or anyone else was, and none of them knew about the, you know, my status because my, you know, my parents were embarrassed and ashamed of that and they didn't want anyone to know that I had disgraced the family. So I just kept my mouth shut and pretended like things were okay at the funeral and yeah. like, hadn't seen my family besides that. Wow. It's interesting because when you're cut off from the community, that that's all you've ever known, really. Yeah. Isn't that like, it must feel just, I mean, I'm thinking about the Amish when they get shunned, <laughs> you know, it, it seems a similar thing. Yes. Yeah. It just kicks yeah, out now. Mm-hmm. And you're in outer darkness. Just kidding. Like, <laughs> the people in the group are like, she's in outer darkness. You can't talk to her or, you know, like yes. that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I lost everyone that I had ever known. Everyone that I'd been spending time with had ever had any kind of social interaction with. That and just feels so traumatic. Just even. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I don't know. It's sometimes, um, I feel like it's almost like moving to a different country and some of my closest friends are immigrants because I feel like I relate to that journey of like you walked away from this completely different life and now you're here and I left my city and state I'm still here but it's not the place that I grew up in this is not the culture not the same world that I knew the culture is super different I get that yeah and when you're trying to then become a part of a culture you didn't grow up in it's just like right like I don't have this, the collective experiences I don't have the shared memories I don't have the Oh, hey, do you remember prom? No. <laughs> remember the eight-year-old birthday party? No. Yeah, you didn't have any birthday parties. No. I mean, but you did keep track of how old you were, obviously. So yeah, um, yeah. But you just it's funny, like I have a, a good memory for numbers. And it, I I could remember everyone's birthday. Like someone could just mention it in passing. Like I have this file like February 4th, and I could think of three people that were, you know, oh yes, my gym teacher said that was her birthday. And my cousin's friend. How did like acknowledge them publicly or ever say happy birthday to someone yeah it's so interesting so I'm thinking because we talked about how you're a four six generator and many of my listeners understand human design so the line four is so much about community and connection and it's about stability so I'm thinking there was even this more like this unstable feeling of now what like I had this stable place right you feel safe and secure and there's community and connection, all of a sudden there's no stability. Now there's no community, no connection. You know, it's like, and even the finances, it's like, uh uh-oh, I'm kicked out now on my own, right? Right. Where's the safety net, like you said? Wow, right? So I guess I've been, I don't know, I should show you my whole chart or you should look it up, but I have a good ability to manage resources, to attract resources, and like things is just somehow work out. Like I applied for different jobs. I got happened to be in a small town bank and just hanging out in the bank. I was able to learn all the things I needed to know. I would just like go make a cup of coffee and be like, Oh, Hey, Jeff, you work in escrow, right? What is that all about? What's escrow? That's a great, you know? Yeah. And- yes. You had a care. You had a, you had a interest in going mm-hmm. to work, you know, and you had the energy to go to work, which is great as a generator. <laughs> You're here to work anyway, so this work. Yeah, yeah. But I was, I'm just lucky that that's the job I had, and I was able to learn before, you know, instead of learning the hard way, I was able to say, hey, what's a credit score all about? What does that even mean? Did you go to college after that? Um, yeah, before that or after that? Well, like, because you said as a Jehovah's Witness, you weren't really encouraged to go to college. That is true. Um, I would add a caveat. My father was not a full member of Jehovah's Witness. And so he encouraged me to go to school while I still lived at home. So I did an early graduating high school program and finished um, at 16. And so then I did an associate degree at the local community college while I still lived with my parents from age 16 to 18. Well, so you did have something. That's awesome. I did have that resource. I had a um, a computer science associate degree, two-year degree. So Amazing. Yes. Well, because starting out. Yeah, well, because some women in these kind of religions 
would never be encouraged to go to college. You know? Right, right. Um, yeah, a lot of my peers weren't um, people I knew. So I, I especially like- women. Now, I think in Jehovah's Witnesses, though, it's not just women, isn't it? Women and men. Um, yeah, no, it's very much something to be ashamed of if anyone gets more than vocational training. If someone gets a full bachelor's degree or more, it's considered that they don't have faith in God. They're, they're show, putting their faith in themselves instead of their faith in God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone is encouraged to work the minimum amount necessary and to put the most amount of time out knocking on doors. So they have constant testimonials or people giving their experiences of turning down scholarships, turning down full-time job opportunities and saying, hey, I could have been like the top engineer in the country, but instead I clean doctor's offices part-time at night so that I can spend my daytimes knocking on doors. And then everyone cheers. And that service aspect, the service to the church is very important. That's yeah, right. yeah. So that's highly emphasized. So we ex- Expected career paths are typically trade, um, self-employed. There's, um, for women, typically cosmetology, hair, nails, janitorial. Um, a lot of people do window washing. Interesting. Yeah. Cleaning, um, Just so you can have a part, something that's more part-time. So you have, yeah. you're available for more regular, quote, regular hours for yes. service. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's definitely what's emphasized there. So um, it was very much an anomaly that I was allowed to and encouraged to have that computer science degree, which. Which yeah. served you. <laughs> yes. yes. I'm very, very grateful for. And that is not something that a lot of people have. I'm very lucky as somebody who grew up in that church to be able to have a, any kind of college and have that. Yeah. So now you, so you were kicked out. You had this three years. Then what happened? I started going to night classes. I'm like, well, I had this impulse to work and work and do and do. And the church felt that. And I was in the church. I'm like, eight hours a day isn't cutting it. I need to do more. So I started going to night classes to work on getting my bachelor's degree. While I was there, I met a Mormon. And we had this long conversation about religion, comparing doctrines. And I just had like this rush of guilt and shame. Like, why am I, you know, messing up things with God? I need to go back to the church and fix things and get back to my family and my community. And, you know, where I had that support network, I I miss being part of that. And I just decided overnight, I'm I'm going back. That's it. And so I I came home and told the boyfriend, which is the the same original one, told him he needs to move out of my house. And he didn't take it well. (laughs) upset after three years and thought everything was fine and um, well, well what if we get married instead then we wouldn't be living in sin honestly it wasn't what I wanted but I said fine it seemed like less conflict oh so you married the same boyfriend okay yeah yeah um we really didn't get along great there had already been a lot of conflict and yeah but you got married because then you could go back to the church. Is that what right? It was my goal. Like, okay, I'm going to fix things with the church. I'm going to fix things with God. I'm going to fix things with my family, my community. And if that's what it takes, if it's less hassle to go to the courthouse and get married to you than it is to kick you out because you're throwing a fit, then I guess that's what it is. Wow. Well, okay. So now that you're married, then your family accepted you again or your church? Exactly. So, um, so I went to the court. So like within months, it, you know, that was in October. By December, we were married. We were both 21 at that point. Um, I wrote out my uh, letter to the church elders to let them know, like, hey, look, I'm not sinning anymore. I fixed it. Here's here's why. You know, I recognize how wrong I was, and I'm so sorry, and I want back in. And they said they would take some time to review it, and I would have to attend the church services to show that I was serious, you know, while they're all still treating me like I don't exist. So, that was super hard. That was like the most painful part. It was just like sitting through the church services. You have to like sit on the back row. Nobody can make eye contact with you. You're surrounded by all these people that, that know to, you, right? That they, do know, they know you. This is like, this is everybody you've ever spent time with. You've had dinner at their houses. You, you, you went to the movies with them. You went roller skating, like every single life event, graduation party. And you just don't exist. They won't even like their eyes just slide right off you. And it's so eerie. And you did that for six months. I did that for six months. And during that time I was working full-time and still going to college full-time. And I set up my schedule, like I work eight to five, 
Then I'll drive to the college 30 minutes away, take class from 5.30 to 7. And I'll drive back just in time for the 7.30 evening church service. We go 7.39. So I was, you know, going to two evening church services and the Sunday morning, as well as my full school and work. And I already went home. I already bought a house, you know, before that at age 20. So you were on top of it, though. <laughs> Financially, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Good job. <laughs> And so during that time, when I was trying to get readmitted to the church and like sitting through all these sermons, but not able to participate, you know, just listening, that's when I started to have some doubts about the church. And I, and I was like, well, I'm an outsider right now. So I'm allowed to research the opposition opinion, which as a member, you're strongly, strongly discouraged from doing that. Like it's because anyone who has left is an agent of the devil and is, you know, yeah. working your faith and for sure this apostate so during that time I did you know get on the internet and look at some of the comments of people who have left before and I did read some of their experiences and I entertained some of the you know not I don't want to say contradictory but just some of the apostate what I guess which what they would call it some of the apostate yeah path. yeah I mean did you ever wonder okay this is the rules they tell me is the right way. But then this other church says they're the only ones and they have these rules. Then this other church says this is the only way and they have these rules. Like they're all different rules, but they're all the way. Like, like Yeah, you know? um, so I never, I never considered maybe a different branch of Christianity is more correct to the Bible. But I, I was looking at like, well, is this really true? Are the teachings really right? Are they really based on the Bible? Some of the things may be questionable, but is there still enough to think this is probably mostly majority true or the most likely truest thing? During that time, though, I never questioned deep enough to doubt the historical accuracy of the Bible itself. Like I was still 100% taking every word written in the Bible as 100% History, fact, exactly as it's written, that's what happened. So I was questioning, do Jehovah's Witnesses follow that? Are they the ones that are closest to that? And it was close enough for me to feel like I'm convinced that this is the closest to, to write enough for me to go through the ordeal to get readmitted and get my community back. Yeah. So because you did, right? You went back. I did. I did. Then, um, yeah. So then I spent another decade. I spent another decade as part of so from 21 to 31 I was back in and during that time I had two children I quit working full-time to stay home with my kids I signed up as a pioneer in the church which is one of their higher ranking members where you volunteer to commit to 70 hours a month instead of the normal 10 hours a month of going out knocking on doors and recruiting people wow 70 hours of knocking on doors <laughs> yeah I, I did a, a I did a one-year pledge for that, which you know, kind of confers a little bit of a higher, not really status and rank, but you get a little more respect, a little more like recognition within the community, a little more status, but nothing official. It's not like they're paying you or anything. Right. <laughs> Bragging rights. <laughs> um, they send you to a special two-week school at the end of your one year where you get to sit in a classroom for, you know, for, for two weeks getting extra an extra book that everyone else doesn't have and you get to do extra Bible study about it. So, right. So, I mean, your job though, is to convert people, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, did you keep number, like tallying how many people I converted and all of that? My whole lifetime in it, I never actually converted one. <laughs> okay. That's super fascinating. Okay. Well, well, hold on. Except for the one that I married. Which oh, okay. On to him. You know, it wasn't really the way of it. It's like, I, you know, it was just along for the ride. So. so all the knocking on doors for yeah. well, how many years? Yeah. I mean, from four until 31, subtract the three that I missed, but a lot. <laughs> a lot of knocking on doors. Uh-huh. But we definitely, we had to keep very um, meticulous records. Like you write down how many hours you're out, how many books you, you know, give it to people, how many little pamphlets, like different, like, okay, this was a 30 page for sure. This was a monthly magazine issue. So you have all these records and how many times do you go back and talk to the same person? You get to count that as a different category. That's a return visit. If you 
down and do a formal study where you do like one chapter at a time on somebody, you can get able to record that as a set. Like there's all these different categories. You had to write it on a little slip and then drop it in a box or give it to the, the guy in charge, the elder at the end of the month. And have like quarterly meetings in there, like regional guy comes through and reviews it. And like, all right, your return visits are down 20%. You need to work on this. You know, it's kind of like sales. <laughs> it is sales. Yeah. It is, but without anyone getting commissions, none of us got money. It's like you're volunteering your time, you're volunteering your your car, your gas money, everything, just go around driving around. And I lived in the country, so we were like driving around the county, you know, you go 30 miles out through the hills to find some farmer. And they may or may not be home. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you did your you did a lot of service, okay, and you were in there until 31. And then what happened? Like now, why did you leave the next time? You weren't kicked out, were you, or were you? No, 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 no. I'm actually a fugitive now. So, okay. <laughs> um, so that time I had been beating a blog for a couple years of, so after I finished my like one year pledge, I did extra service. I only did that for one year and I was still a stay at home mom. My kids are starting to get older. My oldest was in preschool. The little one was just watching cartoons and I was kind of losing my interest in being a stay at home mom. So I would get on the computer a lot and I would read this blog of, Somebody who grew up in the Christian evangelical world where they're encouraged to have the most number of children. I think they call it quiver movement. It's the one you told me, yeah. Uh And I'm just reading her life story and her experiences and her journey and losing faith in that community and going from protesting abortion clinics to the opposite, like supporting people getting abortions and like her whole you know, crisis of faith. Um, I think that was pretty influential for me. And then I started reading that. So what was, what was influential about it? Was it the way she changed her mind or? I guess it's, it's hard to attack your own beliefs. It's hard to question your own beliefs, but you can see something that's parallel to your beliefs and it's easier for you to criticize that and it's easier for you to look at that and recognize it it's like man that was a really controlling and patriarchal group like I'm glad you got out of that like what about mine like that, is it like huh that feels a little you know it's like some cognitive dissonance like it's a little maybe it's a little close to home um I don't know so it kind of started those gears turning it was more um subconscious at that point I wasn't like actively aware of my doubts but I was starting to, um, like she identified as a feminist and I was, you know, thinking like, well, I, I think I'd support those values too. Like if I want to be a feminist, is that contradictory with my identity as a Jehovah's witness? Can I be both? I started studying like Myers-Briggs personality types at that time. And I'm like, well, I'm an INTP and every other INTP that I can find on the internet, they're all atheists. Maybe I'm supposed to be an atheist. Like I have, was having all these different thoughts about my identity and do these different identities I'm I'm finding do they fit together or am I going to have to let one of them go and again like I said that was all during my my Saturn return the four years that I was a stay-at-home mom was like exactly aligned with when I stayed home with my kids and then I ended up going back to work right after but um and we moved to the country and I had chickens and it was just a completely different life than any other chapter of life I've been in but what all kind of brought it to a head was when my oldest child was around eight or nine and ready to take the steps to like, hey, I want to become an official member of the church and work on getting baptized and, you know, giving um, talks, presentations, getting up on stage, getting involved, like committing as an official member, not just, you know, my kid that's going along with me, but actually signing up. And and for me, I, I felt like I had all these flashbacks to all the time whenever I got disfellowshipped and shunned and how painful that was. And knowing that that's what happens, like it's really, it's pretty impossible to make it through your teenage years and into adulthood without experiencing that in, your, in that community. And even if my kid was one of the rare kids that never experimented with premarital sex, with any drugs, with smoking, with drinking, um, any of the forbidden things, you know, God forbid that you're not to be gay. Like I've had friends that were excommunicated because they were gay and there's option there. Like you're out, that's it. So I was just thinking like, gosh, even, even if my kid's one of the very few that makes it all the way through their friends, they're going to have to go through that with their friends. They're going to have to shut 
friends. It's, it's no matter how you look at it, it's going to be really painful. Yeah. Early childhood, you know, they're excluded at school because they can't do birthday parties, but we still have a community and they have friends there. And I feel like it offset, but the like benefit, like the pros and cons for them going through their teenage years in the church, just really kind of triggered all those memories for me. And I started really questioning, like, am I a thousand percent convinced that this is absolutely the only one true right path? Because it's going to be really painful for my kids and is it worth it? I have to make sure it is before I let them sign up and, and commit to the church. So I, I started with my, my first like doubt, like, well, there's something that's kind of been at the back of my mind for a long time. I haven't really looked into it. I'm sure we have a good explanation in one of Jehovah's Witness reference books somewhere, but instead of comparing do Jehovah's Witnesses teach what's in the Bible, I went with, is what's in the Bible compatible with what I know about the world? Did the flood actually happen in the exact year and in the exact way as it's taught by Jehovah's Witnesses? And they have it in their reference books. And I thought like, I've kind of wondered about that for a long time. I never really dove in. I did. I like pulled out all the reference books Jehovah's Witnesses had and I went through everything and they have it pinned down to an exact year. And it's like 3,400 BC. And I'm looking at that. I'm like, aren't there civilizations in buildings older than that? Like pyramids? What about India? Like what about Mayan or Aztec? Like that's not that far back. Like as a kid, sure, it seemed forever. But like looking at that as an adult, I'm like, 3,500 BC? It's like, okay, and whatever number of animals are on this exact, every single animal is in this limited like space. And I was trying to read their explanations and it's like, okay, so then after that, the number of animals that are on that have diversified to the number of animals that exist now. I'm like, that is evolution on a massive scale that's not even like, no one even thinks that could happen. Like within a few thousand years, the diversity of every single ecosystem on this planet like that's so okay. interesting yes kangaroos in australia like they were all on the ark or they were descended from something on the ark and they got there was a land bridge to australia as i was reading through their explanations it was getting more and more convoluted and i'm like i don't think i can reconcile this this is just yeah isn't that interesting yeah this is just wild like fascinating hmm. yeah like it's always been here and I, I i knew like there's a chapter on it and i just hadn't really dug into that chapter like oh i know it's there i know there's an explanation i'm sure it makes sense and I tried to actually read it and understand it. This does not make sense. Yeah. This is wild. Like, I got to support this. And almost overnight, I just, like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> um, I, I tried a couple times, like, to go to church after that. I had a few assignments because we, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we would get up on stage and do, like, a, a demonstration. Of course, men could give a sermon facing the audience. Women could face the audience and teach men. So they would have a woman assigned to do like a skit with another woman. So you would sit at a table and your microphones and you would write a little five minute skit dialogue where you teach another woman something about the Bible. Anyway. But you wouldn't be looking at the audience. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. You couldn't look at the audience because you can't teach the audience, but you could do a demonstration of how you would teach another woman. So, okay. <laughs> a scenario like uh, this woman is somebody at a bus stop and they're worried about poverty. And so then I'm going to read scriptures about how God's going to provide abundance and prepare. And you would have to think of an idea, write a script, time it. Like that was the whole thing. Well, if I say church, you imagine like what normally people would think of as church. It wasn't that. It, it's like sales, but using the Bible. <laughs> so we're practicing pitches. We're practicing how to overcome conversation stoppers. You're practicing volume and modulation and, Interesting. Yeah. It's like a training course for. Right, right, right. So anyway, that was something I had been involved in and part of since I was eight is one of, you know, you had to enroll in that as. But. So after I had lost my faith in it, the only time they went to church were to fulfill the assignments I had already received. Like they, I had already been given my assignment, like, oh, hey, you're doing this skit next month on Thursday for whatever topic. So I still showed up to fill my duty. Like, I, I know I have an obligation. I, you know, on the schedule, I have to show up and do this. But I didn't go to any other 
services. And I was normally like regular, all like three services a week. But at that point, I just went like, I think once a month from October, November, December, January, I went like once a month just to do the. Is it, is it because you were worried to tell them that you didn't want to come anymore or, or you didn't feel ready yet to say that? If I was to tell them I didn't want to come anymore, then I would be right back on the secret trial and right back excommunicated and shunned. I don't want to participate in their trial. I've already, I've already studied what there is to study. There's nothing they can say that's going to change my mind. I'm going to, go, oh, now it does make sense. So the koalas can swim, you know, whatever. It makes sense. I, I'm done. I'm over it. But I still like have my sense of duty and obligation. So I'm going to show up and fulfill what I've agreed to do, which was to get my skit. You know, the last couple months that I had already on the schedule. But I, I quit going out knocking on doors. I tried once more. But I couldn't say anything like I didn't believe any of the stuff I was supposed to say. I didn't want to give them any of our like books and pamphlets. I figured it was all nonsense. So, so I just like volunteered to go by myself, you know, you, like split up. Okay, you take this side of the street, I take that side. And two people weren't here. I'm like, oh, I don't mind going by myself. And when somebody opened the door, I was just saying, well, you know, I introduced myself. And instead of my use, usual like speech that I would go into. I just said, we are encouraging folks to read the Bible for themselves. That, that's all. Have a great day. If you have a Bible, read, read it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, that's all I, and you know, I go back to the car and like, oh, did they take any book? I'm like, oh no, they, they weren't interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, so is this what you're still doing today or? No, 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 no. Okay. No, no, I'm away so from happen then that you actually no. yeah so I no I couldn't say like that was the last time I tried that once you know once I'm like I can't do this and I, that was all I say like I can't just lie to this person but I can't go out to pretend like I have the answers to everything because I I don't anymore these don't make sense anymore so I quit going to church I you know I did the last few assignments I had agreed to do and my, my husband had joined the church with me. And then at this point, I was telling him all my doubts. And he was a little on the fence, like, wait, you know, I, I believed in this too. I signed up for it. We've been doing this for 10 years together. We've been married for 11 years at that point. And I'm like, yeah, nah, here's why I think pretty sure it's false. Sorry about that. And I sat my kids down. I'm like, hey, you know, all those things I told you, like, I, sorry, but I, I think I was wrong. I actually don't think God's going to be mad if you have your birthday party at school now or if you have treats on Valentine's Day when your class is doing a party, I don't think you have to sit out in the hallway on the floor this time. But, you know, kids were in um, kindergarten and second grade and it was hard. It was, it was weird. Um, just changing that overnight. And so the kids had their holiday party at school. They had Valentine's and then somebody reported it to the church. Somebody saw the kids eating Valentine's treats and they freaked out and the elders started like, calling me all the time, calling my husband all the time and showing up at our house unannounced. And it had been like five months maybe since I had been you know, having doubts and not really attending. And um, But they couldn't really like pin anything on us because the kids weren't official members and the official members hadn't actually done the holiday. Like what, what kids do you have? So it was like kind of a loophole. They couldn't really pin something. Like they knew something's not right. Like, why would you let your kids do a holiday? And, you know, my husband was kind of on the fence until that point, and that upset him the way they were treating him. And he's like, my kid's in kindergarten. You're going to tell the kindergartner they can't have candy. He's like, you're mad at me because my kindergartner ate the candy at school. Like, did you tell them to? Or, <laughs> But it's kind of a weird gray area. They couldn't really, there wasn't really enough evidence to prosecute, to put us on trial. And after that, we just... We actually ended up getting divorced because I, mean, I mentioned we didn't really have the greatest relationship in the, in the first place. And so about a, a year after that, we split up. But because my first thing, like, OK, if I'm not in the church, I'm going back to school because I sacrificed that for God. And I want a career and I want an education. And it really threw out the dynamic of our relationship. Um, instead of being a stay at home mom, I wanted to work and pursue further degrees and make more money than him and everything. And so he didn't stay in the church either. No, we both left the church. Then once I was going to school and got a new job and like, Hey, I've got this new career. I'm working in it now. And I have, you know, almost done my bachelor's degree. Um, and during that time, 
I got pregnant with our youngest kid, which yeah, wasn't, wasn't planned, at least by me, it certainly wasn't planned by me. I was already kind of one foot out the door on the, the marriage, but some of his behavior shortly thereafter definitely clinched that. He started kind of getting controlling and like stalking and threatening. And uh, I just left. And But you're back to the place now where the church, the people who are still in the church aren't talking to you again, like you're oh, well, sort of, or not really. You're not really excommunicated. So I'm not officially excommunicated. So as far as I know, I just haven't shown up for a long time. Could be any reason. I could be depressed. I could be sick. I could whatever. I have never shown up a trial. I've never officially made some kind of announcement or declaration about my beliefs or, or lack of beliefs. The only people that I cared about keeping a relationship with are my parents, which so far I have been able to um, keep the relationship with them. Honestly but tactfully and diplomatically. And so they, they did ask like, why aren't you, you know, showing up? I, you know, we heard that you haven't been, or you haven't been for several weeks. It's because your husband, isn't it? I'm like, no, it has nothing to do with him. And I said, I've been, I've been researching the, the flood and some of what I'm reading just really doesn't make sense to me. Like, you know, here's, here's a list of all the reference books I've looked in. I've looked in the inside book, the reason book, and this magazine, this watch tire, this awake, and none of this is adding up to what makes sense. And I don't feel comfortable going out talking about it if it doesn't, if I can't explain it. Yeah. Or saying, well, well, what if we arrange for this other elder to meet with you? He's really smart. And, I, and I'm trying to explain it in a way that makes sense. And I said, no, no, thank you. Like, I appreciate that, but no. And so... I'm, I'm very, very thankful. I know a lot of people whose parents have not accepted that or who have preemptively shunned them, even though the church hadn't officially sanctioned it or declared it. So at least at this point, I do still have um, that, that good relationship for, with my, my mom and dad. They did move out of state after that, but we do stay in touch. And okay. Yeah, so you don't have to be around them all the time anyway. So it's not like... Right, so it's not like it's a crisis bringing it up every day, like rubbing it in. And I, I try not to mention the things that I do that I know are outside of their beliefs. Like they know that I do some things, but I don't... Because if it feels like you have a Christmas tree behind you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, you are different now. And so you don't, like, they don't celebrate Christmas probably. So right, right. They, they, so yeah, they know that, but they don't want to like hear about it. So it's like, so if it's something that they find as tasteful, then I'm not going to mention it and like rub it in their face or whatever. And Yeah. It's like the don't ask, don't tell policy. <laughs> just <laughs> pretty just much. Talk pretty about much. it. Yeah. Pretty much. So, so it um, sounds like you came to a good place for yourself. Yeah, so I, I feel like I've, I'm proud of how I've navigated that. It's it's been interesting, but it was definitely something that was easier to do the second go round because, like, the first time it was completely unexpected, unprepared, and this time as a fully grown adult, like I had a sense of self. And there's certain things I did beforehand that like started to prepare myself for it. Like probably like a year before I left, I started a Facebook account, and I didn't have any Joe Woods on it. I had all of them on my Instagram, but I didn't have any of them on my new Facebook account. And I didn't even know myself at the time why I did that. I was like, I wonder how many people I know, like how much support do I have? How many people in this entire world do I actually know that are not part of this? It's like, well, there's a cousin, maybe there's somebody I used to work with, someone I met at school, a neighbor, my kid's friend from school, their parent. And I was like slowly building up, like it was a small group, of, like a small social network, which is you know really important to me and my type I am. <laughs> line four, you're lying. Yeah, four. yeah. So I like having the resources, having that social draw on. And so I like slowly built that up over time. And I remember there was like a certain post, like in a January, that was like right after I quit going to the church. The very last service I went to was like January 1st of 2015 and like a week or two later I, I posted it was just some random thing like a recipe but I posted it on my Instagram and my Facebook at the same time like okay I'm going to measure this like statistical how much support do I have within my John Woods community that I'm about to walk away from and how much support do I have in the whole rest of the world outside of that and to see like just how many people liked my popcorn that I made or whatever it was yeah so now you found community on Facebook 
right? Like right yeah. now, like right um, now, you said you are starting a community on Facebook or you have a community on Facebook or what is it? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so gosh, in the seven years, it's almost exactly to the day of seven years since the last time I was in, in the church and I'm 38 now, but I have built so many communities and I have a hundred percent trust in myself no matter what happens in life, no matter what crazy things show up, I can find community. I can find new friends. I can make connections. And that's really important to me. And it's something that I take a lot of comfort in and a lot of pride in that I, I can do that. Like I, I had like my community stripped away from me and I can build a new one. I can like rise from the ashes. And it was hard at first, but First of all, going to school, I went back to college and I made connections there. I made a lot of good connections, um, finished my bachelor's degree. I went on to do a uh, master's degree immediately after. So while I was going through the divorce and having my last you know, child, I had this newborn. I was like straight into, OK, I'm working full time. I'm doing my master's degree. Yeah, good for you. I mean, it feels inspiring just to hear. You know, I, I hope that other people are inspired by this because coming from a place where, you know, you're told not to think for yourself. Just right. faith. These are the rules. This is what yeah. you need to believe. All of that. And then being kicked out of the community and then going back in and then going back out, right? Like it's this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when I think back to like, man, I was like a stay at home mom, no income, you know, a two year degree, but I didn't have anything beyond that. And like, I remember thinking like, man, what, you know, my kids talking about, well, I want to be a scientist. I want to be this. And how can I encourage my kid to be the best they could be if I didn't? Like, here I am doing nothing. Like, I'm just sitting at home reading celebrity gossip and, you know, wearing my bathrobe all day, not even like getting dressed. Like, man, what kind of example am I setting? Like, I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's too late. I wonder if I could go back and still do like computer programming. And it's never too late, right? And never. I thought, like, like, there's no way. Like, I'll just go into the university and I'll ask them. I'll say, hey, I dropped out 10 years ago. Can I pick up where I left off with computer programming and business? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, but really? I'm like, I'm sure changed a lot technology like moves quickly and they're like no it looks like you're good um they're like uh, yeah we added one course in business ethics you need one extra class but yeah you can jump right back into the program you're in and finish it out within a year great oh, doing it let's do this yes and i did and i mean i believe the best thing we can do for our kids is be ourselves you know what i mean it's like if we can be ourselves and show that we can trust ourselves and believe in what we want to do, they can be themselves. <laughs> they can yeah. do what they want to do, you know? So for a while, I felt like I was just like frantically rushing and trying to make up last time. Like, oh my God, I have to do everything. Like I've never been to a nightclub before. I need to go out and party. Like I have never done anything. Like I've never gambled. I've never, like I have a list of sins on my bucket list of things. Oh my gosh, I have to try this. All these things that I, you know, have always been forbidden and yeah. So in my thirties, like going through the, you know, what probably people usually do in their teenage years, but it was just like a totally different life. And I don't know how much regular astrology fits with this, but in like regular Western astrology, my Saturn and Pluto are conjunct in my fifth house. So hobbies and friends and fun and play and fun, right? Children All the play is in my you know fifth house. And so both of those were like super, limiting. I was super limited on all of that fifth house stuff until after I returned and suddenly it was like release in my 30s like oh I can I can do that now there's no one stopping me like I don't Wait, have did you say the sun was in the fifth house or what was in the fifth no, no, house? uh Saturn and Pluto with a one degree conjunction oh wow yeah so it's super tight both very limiting yeah after my Saturn return though it was just like the clouds lifted I'm like I'm allowed to have fun now I can that's interesting <laughs> Yeah. I have friends now. I, I can, can be creative. I can yeah. have hobbies. I can go places. Like I'm, I'm allowed to just do stuff. I can watch an already movie. Oh, Congratulations. Like, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's been, it's been really fun. And I always say like my thirties are so much better than my twenties or the other days. And, and no disrespect to my parents. I love them dearly. I think they, you know, loved me a lot and did it the best they could and certainly believe in that they raised me. And But that's the, my favorite belief is they did the best they could because that's what they really believed was right. You know, that's my favorite thing to believe about the past. Like my parents did the best they could, you know? Yeah. yeah. So there's, you know, we're not going to go back and change any of it. So 
Miranda, thank you so much for sharing this story with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and I do have a Facebook group called Religious Trauma Healing that is a lot of ex Jehovah Witnesses, some ex Mormons, some former Seventh day Adventists. Um, a lot of them are also interested in like astrology and spiritual communities. I work through some of the things I've learned in therapy and some of the things I've learned from cult experts. Yeah. So how would people find that? Is there like, I mean, do you have to be your friend or do you just go type in? I, I think you can just search religious trauma healing. There's like religious some, trauma healing. Okay. There's some like star emojis before it. And then there's a couple of membership questions you have to answer that I can approve. So religious trauma healing group. So I will put it in the show notes. And then I also have started writing a few blog posts on astrology and tarot society that I'm part of. And they've asked me to write a few blog posts with my life story. So I've started that and the first post is up and I can send you a link to that as well. Yeah, just send me the links and then some of the same stuff I shared here, but more like what my childhood was like as a Jehovah. Yeah. Cause I'm sure this is going to help somebody. So I appreciate you sharing with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Bye. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, please go subscribe so that you get notified of all the future goodies that are coming along. While you're there, please leave me a review and let me know what you think. So excited to share this with you and can't wait to talk to you next time. Bye.